this job anymore. And I want it to not just feel like a job. I want to feel like I have purpose. I can share my passion, my gifts every single day. I can see a huge a, a population of the mainstream audiences falling in love with your sense of humor. And like I'm talking Dane Cook, bigger than Dane Cook kind of stuff. You know, and they're just like, and, I go, and they're like, and I'm like, this is funny, ready? And they're like, I got superpowers, superpowers, I got superpowers, superpowers, I got superpowers, superpowers, working seven days a week and 24 hours. Yep. Jason Hewlett, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Laban, I can't believe we're finally doing this, man. I love it. You're one of my favorites. Thanks for having me on. Well, you stole my thunder there, folks. We've done 220-something podcasts. We've had Nobel Prize laureates, Olympic gold medalists, spiritual leaders, carnivore doctors people that have rode solo from one side of the planet to another but i'm very confident in saying jason is easily the funniest guest we've ever had on and i can say that with a great d degree of confidence because he probably is and i'm just saying probably because i don't want to make any definitives here the funniest person i've ever had the honor of spending time with so i am so excited and so grateful that you have you on the show so thank you very much hey man right back at you i don't know the last time i've laughed so hard as when we met and the one chance we had to hang out with you know a dear friend of ours waldo waldman and uh the wingman and of course your lovely bride uh and yourself that was one of the funniest nights i can remember we were having a a good time laughing our heads off about the being locked in Disney. That's what we'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just for context, folks. So I, uh, Jason and I were connected through uh, Lieutenant Colonel Waldo Wallman, who's uh, another Hall of Fame speaker and an incredible writer and, and uh, mentor and coach and friend. And he was speaking at an event at Disney World of Florida. And uh, this is where we had an opportunity to meet Jason and, and for the, the, the gala dinner afterwards, we were actually held temporary prisoner uh, in, the, in the venue when we were trying to leave. And uh, amongst many talents, Jason has uh, a Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse. I don't know what you call it. What is it? Is it, is it Mickey Mouse? Oh, boy. Hi, everybody. We're locked in here forever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hey, there's Laban. Let's get him. Ah, hey, Goofy. <laughs> yep. Let's get Laban and slam him into the ground. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. it's Mickey and Donald and Goofy and all them, you know. I don't know. I've been doing those forever, man. <laughs> oh, man. I didn't, that's going to go, bro. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot. But it, but it was hilarious. We're stuck in Disney World, and, and Jason's able to really lighten the mood with these incredible uh, accents and these these impressions. So, yeah, absolutely. One of the most hilarious moments in my life. I can hand on heart say that. But in all seriousness, Jason uh, Hewlett is an incredible, uh, well-rounded entertainer, speaker, brilliant author, father, husband. And I really, really wanted an opportunity to bring him on so to introduce him to an audience that probably has never heard of him before. So once you finish this, go and ravage everything you can online and find this man. And that's, that's the extent of the tire pumping I'm going to give you right now, I think. <laughs> right on, man. No, I appreciate you telling everybody about what I do. And I, I've been telling lots of people about you. I mean, ever since listening to your book, as I've told you already, as I was texting you while I was listening to it, because I would, it's probably the first audiobook I've ever listened to while working out and enjoying. Usually, an audiobook is so slow that you can't work out and feel pumped up. But listening to your audiobook while I worked out, I was lifting more weights. I was pulling the row machine faster. I was like, this is so funny and fascinating and poignant because you're so animated and you're so pumped. And I mean, I felt like a superhero listening to you. So right back at you, man. Well, man, I graciously receive and accept that. I mean, it's, that's what you, you, you kind of, 
hope to do when you're putting pen to paper and you want to create a visceral response and people, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. And, and when you know, inviting you onto the show, Jason, I really had no idea what direction I wanted to take this because you're such a multi-dimensional entertainer. But maybe a good place to start is what's what's on your heart these days that that you want to bring out into the world? What a great question. You know, I've been doing a lot less keynote speaking lately, where that's what I've been doing now for the last 20 plus years. And as I've been in the midst of waiting for the next gig to come in, which obviously I'm working on that, but I have, I only have one or two scheduled for the next few months, which is really a nice change for me. In the past, I was doing about 200 dates a year back before the kids came along. And then when we had children, we lessened that to maybe 70 gigs a year. So now having one or two a month is a big shift. But what's on my heart of recent is that I've been consulting and coaching with companies, executives, and speakers as well. People that have created a great business and are looking to become a speaker. How do you do that? How do you create a career out of it? How do you write a book and actually get it finished? Because we don't want to die with that within us. And so I've been doing a lot of consulting for companies and I've found that the people that I'm working with, every single person that I've always known this intrinsically, Laban, I've always known it. And I've spoken about it all over the world. Everyone truly has superhero powers. Everyone has what I call signature moves. And what's so frustrating to watch within the consulting of a company is when people aren't doing those superpowers. When people are pigeonholed or siphoned off or in their own little silo, working on something, trying to keep their survival within the company, when in reality, they could be sharing, hey, I could do this better for you if you're willing to listen to me as a leader. So I'm going into these companies as a consultant and as a leader and saying, tell me your story. And they'll give me their story. And the next thing I know, I'll, I'll be like, now, why is it that you're in sales and customer service when you're actually better at accounting and finance? And it's interesting to see how people are either just taking on whatever's being thrown at them and not speaking up or the fact that some people are taking on so much they don't have enough chance for their superhero powers to come out of the woodwork. That's what's on my heart. And that's why I'm so excited to chat with you today. Well, mate, it's amazing. I'm curious to know when, when you're having these conversations with people, is it usually right in front of them what their superpower is? Uh, in some cases, yeah. I would say some people have buried it away and they're even concerned to even bring it up almost as, as if it's like a bad omen for them to say anything, you know. But there are some people where I just go, wait a minute, you need to stop doing what you're doing right now and I want to shift your perspective into what if you did these things instead? And you can see a, a sort of relief come over them almost like Clark Kent taking off the glasses to become Superman. It's like they go into their phone booth while I'm talking to them and I can see the shift where they're like, thank you, finally someone's listening. That's a really special moment. And it's not every single time. There are some people I have to dig and prod and beg and plead. And eventually they'll say, okay, I trust that you're willing to listen to me enough. I can be vulnerable enough to share my greatness. And that's a really wonderful thing as well. So... It just depends on where the person is, I think, spiritually. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, uh, I, I love those moments that you observe, like the, the veil falls away and they realize what it is that they really are passionate about. And in my, the reason I asked you that question was, in my experience, most people, it's either presented itself at least on one big moment in their life or many, many times at a lesser level. And they've just kind of politely ignored it. And I, I, I talk about God slaps and I'm pretty sure I didn't coin the phrase, but you know, we get these gentle taps from God, the universe or whatever, you know, your place of sources. And then we, we don't pay attention. Then all of a sudden it goes, whack. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right. I'll give up 14 years of IT recruitment, which with the benefit of retrospect, I absolutely despise and then go into a job just as the world's going to collapse around my ears. And while I'm already destitute broke, I'm going to be locked in my home for two years, 
unable to earn any money and then still make it work. It's just venting. So, so good. You're so right. And I love the God slap concept. I believe that it is a, a divine kick to our bodies once we realize, oh gosh, I should have been doing it this way. And that's okay. We don't need to regret what we've done. It's just part of the experience, right? But how cool is it when somebody starts to realize somebody's listening to me and willing to help me share my gifts and talents that I haven't been able to. And it's really, uh, it's really like a handcuff moment. You know, they get the keys, they get rid of that thing that they say, gosh, I, I don't know if I love this job anymore. And I want it to not just feel like a job. I want to feel like I have purpose. I can share my passion, my gifts every single day. That's, I mean, there are some people I know that would work for free just to be able to do that. But, you know, they, they take the pay because they need it anyway. But the truth is when we give somebody the keys to be able to say, hey, go do your talents. Go, go keep your promise. That's what I call it. Keep your promise to share your gifts and talents. You're the only one that can do what you do, so you need to do it. Well, you wrote a book uh, that came out in, uh, I think, August 2020. Right. Uh, called yeah. called Promise the, to the, the Promise to the One, which uh, is not your first book by any stretch, but I really, really enjoyed it. And there was a, a, a chapter in there where you were, you're a performer, um, grew up in, in Utah and was doing very well in Utah. And then you got approached by the, the head honchos in, in Las Vegas. And I wondered if you'd happily share that story with our audience today about what happened. Yeah, so I am from uh, Utah, and Utah obviously has a predominant culture of the uh, members that are of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they're commonly known as Mormons. I grew up in that culture. I'm still in that culture, but I became a performer and an entertainer, and so my my calling card, if you will, Laban, was that I'm going to be an entertainer that is family-friendly but is Las Vegas quality. And that is a very small niche, you know, because Las Vegas is known for something a bit opposite of where I'm from. And so when I got called by the people in the casinos in Las Vegas, and it was multiple casinos that were after me, I had put together a one-man show of music, impressions, comedy, storytelling, and even inspiration. And as I performed for these different casino owners, they were fighting over me as to who's going to get me and have me as their showman for their showroom. That's a pretty big honor. I was 25 years old. I'm now 45. So this is a 20 year old experience. But what's so interesting about it is that as we came down to it, the main people that had brought my hero to Las Vegas, his name was Danny Gans. Danny Gans was an impressionist entertainer who had just signed a $150 million gig to perform every night at his own showroom. And he did a fairly clean show. He was very popular, a Christian artist, and, and he did impressions, and he was amazing. Family man as well. This was in 2004, Laban. The new uh, theme of Las Vegas was what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And so Danny Gans had come to Vegas in the 90s when it was a family-themed attempt in Vegas to make it that. I came to Vegas when it shifted over into something a little different. And they needed me to keep up with the times and keep up with the theme. In other words, they wanted to shift my show. They wanted to manage it. They wanted to tell me what to perform and what material would be best for their audience. I remember as we went back and forth with this contract, because this was a big deal, to have your name in lights, on taxis, billboards, your own showroom. They're betting a lot of money on you. You're betting a lot of your life on them. Uh, we just came to a consensus that, my promise for myself was different than the promise that they had made to their audience. And if I were to break that promise to myself, I don't know if I could live with myself. So my wife and I made a very big choice. It was a hard one to walk away from the Las Vegas opportunity of a lifetime that I don't know anyone that's ever turned that kind of thing away. In fact, I have lots of friends that have since signed big contracts and are still on the strip and have done well. But I can tell you that for me, and at my time and my moment, that was not my path. And uh, I decided to keep a promise to myself, my family, and my legacy to say, I'm just going to go and continue to do what I do around the world for corporations that will have me. And I'm so thankful for the many corporate events that I've been able to do now for 20-plus years 
as a headliner, as a keynote speaker, and as somebody who shares a message of entertainment mixed with some powerful educational content that's inspiring. And for those who don't know, folks, Jason is, uh, has been inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame already. That happened a few years ago. One of the youngest uh, inductees in, in national speakers' history, as far as I'm aware, which is a huge big deal. And I know you've played that down when we've spoken to you. And one of the things I would say to you, Jace, is especially being in comedy, there's obviously a lot of self-deprecating humour and, and uh, playing down of stuff. One of the things that I've implemented in my own life in the last three or four years is very, very unlikely to hear me ever use negative self-talk about myself because I used to use it as a validation seeking technique and, and uh, it didn't serve me very well. And I listened to some of your stuff and I, and it's as brilliant as it is, there's times where I go, oh, I just, I wish that he just wouldn't say that about himself. Like, cause I I've seen just how brilliant you are and it's the ultimate downplay, but you really remind me of someone like uh, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, who was known as a, a clean comedian. Do you, have you drawn much inspiration from his work at all? And that, that really means a lot. I love Seinfeld and uh, maybe the greatest documentary I've ever seen is the movie comedian for anybody that's interested in finding out how Jerry Seinfeld left at the top of his game when his TV show was over and he, he ended it when it was number one. He didn't want it to fade off and fade out. And then he went off and he started documenting the process of creating a new act as a comedian. And it is so fascinating because it's opposite another comedian who's on his way up. And here's Jerry Seinfeld at the top of the game. And so Jerry is so humble, and yet he's so confident. And I hope that even within my self-deprecation, which I do use way too much of that as a speaker, whereas within the comedy it works, as a speaker it doesn't. And I'll tell you, with, uh, with watching him do this movie of Comedian, and I hope your listeners and viewers will consider checking it out, but it's the ultimate play in how you – must fail as much as possible in order to succeed. That failure is progress. That trying things on stage that bomb is the best thing for you. And that is so true in life, in business, in relationships, you name it. Go for it. Don't hold back. Yes, you'll fall, but you've got to get back up. And it's one of my favorite movies of all time. So that means a lot you'd bring him up. Well, I, I mean, I don't mean to gloss over the fact that you just told Las Vegas to go and get stuffed, uh, <laughs> which uh, no one in their right bright brain would ever do uh, unless they were, had strong convictions and morals. It's one of the many things that I really admire about you, Jason. I, I don't mean to make this a big smoke-blowing podcast, but I really, truly uh, uh, acknowledge you for that because it, it would be a very easy thing to justify and, and who knows what direction in your life yeah, I'm sure it'd be completely different if you were still alive at all. Yeah, it would have been quite different. And uh, the friends that I've had that have signed those contracts, their lives have turned out way different than mine. And I honor them at the same time because I know that they've chosen a certain path and that's the that's the way that they needed to go. For my family, for myself, I knew that if I were to grab a hold of that rod and go for it, things would have been different. And I wanted to have a certain path a certain way. And so I think that we know intrinsically when something is right and something's not for us. Uh, it's just having the courage to walk away from a life-changing opportunity because there might be something around the bend that's even better. Am I right in saying that you probably wouldn't change anything for the world for that decision? No, well, wouldn't change it. Do I sometimes wonder what it would be like? Sure. Uh, I have a lot of gigs in Vegas still. I still do a lot of corporate co conventions and things like that. So when I pull into town and I see the billboards of my friends and people that I, you know, I don't know anymore and these types of things, I go, I wonder what that'd have been like. And I have that nice thought for about three seconds, and then I am grateful for what I chose instead. <laughs> well, I've got some, I got some good news for you. I reckon. I, I don't think your Las Vegas days are done yet. In, in that context. I think 
even though you know you talk about in the book in the book that they they actually blacklisted you from being a headline act is that correct that's right yeah when you turn away vegas in the way that i did uh, they said that I'd never work as a headliner in the town again, just because it's a, even though it's a big town, it's a small town with the ownership of things. So yeah, I don't know how I'll ever have the opportunity again, but I've, I've had plenty of other cool opportunities anyway. So what are you thinking? Well, I, I we spoke about this briefly before we started recording this uh, special of yours on Amazon prime. You can download it pretty much anywhere in the world. I think you are. It's called, um, would you refresh my memory, please? Father time. Father Time. It's about a 45 minute stand up special to comedy special. It is hilarious and you must watch it. But I, I really, I mean, I don't know you super duper well, but what I would say from an observational point of view, Jason, I really truly see that as being your sweet spot. And I think if you were, if you were afforded more time, to focus on it. And maybe now that you're not doing so many keynotes, maybe, maybe this is an opportunity. I can see a huge a, a population of the mainstream audiences falling in love with your sense of humor. And like, I'm talking Dane Cook, bigger than Dane Cook kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe not acting, you know, I watched a good chunk of that movie that you filmed when or you're an actor in when you're about 18 years of age oh there's gonna be no oscars there's gonna be no oscars <laughs> 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 when's the last time you watched oh, that my, back my gosh you did do your homework <laughs> <laughs> i can't remember the name of the movie it was something obscure it's called Crail love yeah that won a independent film award actually as bizarre as it was those are a bunch of friends of mine. We filmed that together. That's funny. You found that. Ah, uh, well, I mean, I was curious. You're obviously a young man, and um, you look like the lead singer out of Limp Biscuit. <laughs> Your little goatee thing as well. It was pretty funny. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, in all seriousness, I think you know, and, and it has to resonate with you. If it doesn't, then you know, it doesn't matter. But uh, I really, really can see you doing more of these Netflix specials. I, I just watched an interview between. Bert Kreischer and Ed Milet. And uh, for those that know Ed Milet's work, he's uh, doing incredible stuff. And Bert Kreischer's, uh, you know, this uh, incredible comedian that's close with Joe Rogan. And it was a side of Bert Kreischer that I'd never seen before. He really opened up and was very honest. And I can, and, and the, so and as part of the message he was sharing, like it was made it super powerful what he was doing and, and everything he's dealing with in terms of addiction and all this other stuff. So, Cool. That's just my encouragement to you. I would, I would love to see more of those specials, and I think that. Oh, would, I appreciate that. That, that. Yeah, that was a hard thing to film, and uh, it's actually not even my best material. I, at least, uh, some people would say I had created for years a show of musical impressions and parody that were like Weird Al meets uh, Jim Carrey, you know, and 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 so I was doing some crazy stuff like taking a Bee Gees song and changing it up where it's like, you know, instead of staying alive, I'd sing singing way high. And I'd be like, well, you can tell by the way I sing this song. I'm singing high, but not for long. Ha, 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 I'm singing way high. I'm singing way high. You know, and I did that kind of thing as a show for years where I jumped from that voice to, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. You know, so I'm just bouncing back and forth between voice and voice. I did that for over 10 years. And then when they called me and asked me on the dry bar comedy, they said, can you put together a show that's not just all musical parodies, but more, you know, some stand up?" And I've never considered myself an actual stand up comedian. I said, I can, I'll try. So Laban, what you watched was my best attempt at being a comedian for a minute, putting that hat on and mixing in my entertainer music style, but also being a dad. And so I was making fun of Father Time in two ways. First, I'm getting old, I'm getting gray, I'm, I'm getting glasses, I'm getting fat, right? That's the first Father Time is catching up. And the second Father Time was, I talked about being a dad and how fun it is to be a weird dad with my kids and doing the, you know, the raptor stuff and scaring them to bed. And <laughs> that was fun for me. So I appreciate the encouragement that you thought it was good because... 
if you read the comments on YouTube about that, it's it's enough to discourage you not to do it again. So I appreciate really? you thought it was cool. Yeah. There's look, there is there's so many haters out there, and I, I have done two attempts at comedy uh, for the Raw Comedy Festival back in Melbourne, back in I think it must have been 2015, 2016, and the the first time I did it, I grossly underestimated just how much. Uh, rehearsal was requ required to to not have to read it off the script because I basically have to had to read it off the script the first time and and it was humiliating enough where I was like I'm going to memorize it and I committed the next one to memory and I got a lot of laughs I, it was funny it was funny and I was like if I practice this every day for a year like how good could I get and I would but I was never pulled to it because that was right at the start of my transformation. I was still drinking and partying and doing drugs back then. So it kind of got lost by the wayside, but I really love that feeling of being on stage and making people laugh. And uh, I, I would love an opportunity to do that. But, you know, if that's, if that's what you were able to put together under those circumstances, imagine what you could do with, you know, a, a team around you of geniuses to help pull that off. Well, that's a great point. And, you know, I can absolutely vouch for the fact that if you spent any time at all working on that craft, you would be a world famous comedian yourself because you have that type of energy. You have that type of delivery. Your brain works in a way that would absolutely work for that. So I, I understand we're, we're like, uh, we're like soul sisters, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I proudly remember when I was young, do you remember that, that band Ace of Bass? And they sang that Heck song. Yeah. Uh, I saw the song. I rewrote the I lyrics. The I, 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 uh, I squished a fly and the guts came out. It's I, I squished a fly. Look into its guts, liver, heart and kidneys. I must have been like eight. Or maybe maybe I was a bit older. <laughs> and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. <laughs> I've never met anyone that's been able to do it. Louis Armstrong. See what? Where where have you been all my life, brother? We should have done a two man show. Uh, well, I saw yeah. the sign. I love it. Now you, now your voice is all beat up from doing Louis Armstrong. Yeah, if so. I do it, if I do it too long. But I uh, I got snoring surgery in two thousand nine, which you would have read about in the book. And uh, you do a, a Chewbacca impression, and mm. I can't. I. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do it anymore because they lasered out my uvula, like the punching bag in the back of my throat. <laughs> lasered out my u uvula. That should be your other book. <laughs> well, that th what was interesting is the, the surgeon was a uh, Jewish guy. He said, um, my son, I'm warning you, once I perform the surgery, you, you won't be able to pronounce certain Hebrew words. And I was like, hoy vey, I'm schwitzing like a meshuggah over here. <laughs> And then in my stand-up, I remember this now, it's coming back to me. I go, as long as I can keep doing my Robert De Niro impression. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> That's what got the crowd rolling because I they didn't laugh straight away, but I just persisted with it intuitively until the place was rolling. Is is Have I tapped into something there from a technique point of view, from a comedy point of view that people could use when they're telling stories at a wedding or somewhere else? Oh, yeah. A lot of the times we throw out some kind of line that we're not quite sure if it's going to land. And, uh, you know, other times we're like, this is going to kill. And then it doesn't. And then we bail on it. We bail on the bit. But if you're willing to throw it out there and the audience is like unsure, it's OK to lean in even further and to keep going with it. I mean, you're talking to a guy who stands up there in front of a bunch of stuffy business people and is like, now I want to show you guys what it's like to put my kids to bed. This is what I do as a velociraptor. You know, and they're just like, and I go, and they're like, <laughs> and I'm like, this is funny. Ready? And they're like, <laughs> so I just have to keep going. Like, and then I start running across the stage. And then they're like, <laughs> You know, that's the most they can get out of themselves. They're like, 
How do people not find this hysterical? What? You may not know me, but let me tell you one thing. I don't care what you think. I'm a just do me, and I want to hear you sing. I got why am I the only one that, well, not the only one, but like, why is this, why is this so funny to me? I just don't get it. I mean, I do get it. I do get it because it's genius. But like, why does it resonate? I don't laugh like this unless I'm around you, Jason. This is, this is unbelievable. Well, the thing is, is like you just said with De Niro, that's stupid. That's funny. That's you putting yourself out there. That is a real gift that you're willing to like go there. And I remember the first time my son had borrowed a skateboard from his friend. And we went to the skate park. My son had never been there. And he saw that big bowl that you could skate down into. It's a big round bowl. And he was standing on the lip, on the lip edge. And I said, you're going to drop into the bowl? And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, you better lean into it. Because if you lean back, you're going to crack your head open. You better lean all the way straight down. Like, you need to dive into it. And he had to be fully committed in order to not fall and break his head open. What was so cool is it took him about an hour to get the guts, and then eventually he leaned in and he just went for it. And it was a perfect lesson as to what you just said, that when you have a bit, a story, something you want to share in your speech, you can't hold back. You can't lean back. You have to go all in. Just like you do in your book with every story you told. You're like <laughs> giving me the whole thing and I'm I'm trying to do weights and I'm like <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing, trying to lift a weight over my head because you're so funny. But it's because you went all in. You call you I call it the promise. You kept the promise to me by giving everything you had to that story, by sharing your full authenticity, by by being vulnerable, and man, some of it's ugly, but that's what's beautiful. And that's when we lean in and everybody goes, oh, I like that. I like that story. I like that guy. Well, thank you again. And I, uh, you know, the, the book really resonated with me in terms of being of your word and just being someone who says what they, that they say they're going to do and will do. One of the, the biggest challenges I've had as an entrepreneur has been connecting with a number of people that failed to follow through and what they've done. And I, and I, full disclosure, have also done that. And I wonder, Jason, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this, whether it's been the times that, I've, that I haven't followed through on my word that are karmically bringing those people into my life. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that can be a, a way that, you know, because of the fact that you didn't keep your word, you know, you had other things happen. But the, the best part about your book for me was that you just kept going despite all the craziness that was happening. I'm thinking about when you were running in the race and you just kept passing that lady and saying hi. And, you know, you just kept you kept going, even though you thought you're going to die. <laughs> like there are so many stories like that in this book where. Even if you think to yourself, well, I did let so-and-so down. The truth is you are keeping more promises than you realize. You kept a promise to yourself to not stop. And so often I think that the promise is, is a significant thing to people because of even, even today. I, I don't know when this is going out, but we're recording on January 11th. And people's resolutions are falling apart from the new year. I mean, I went to the gym this morning, which I go every morning. And I saw last week a smattering of people I've never seen. And I was thrilled that they were there, even though they were on the machines I needed. And then today, <laughs> nowhere to be found. Same time, same place. The promise is over for them. I feel bad for those people. Make a promise and keep it. Do what you know you can do. And you will create confidence in yourself. It will create blessings in your life that aren't necessarily, they're not blessings. They're just because you kept your promise and then more good stuff comes to pass. I'm asking this question for myself more so than anyone else, but I know other people will resonate with this. What do you do when there has been commitments that you've made 
that you haven't reneged on, but you haven't fulfilled, and they maybe should have been fulfilled a lot sooner. Is that salvageable? Oh, yeah, great question. I think this happens to a majority of us every single day. The only problem is that when we don't wake up the next morning and try again. That's it. And so if you say to yourself, I'm going to make a promise to wake up in the morning and go to the gym, and you sleep through that alarm, okay, now you've assessed that you need something else to help you get up. Now, did I stay up too late watching Netflix? Did I drink too much last night? What are the reasons that made it so I couldn't keep the promise today? And those are the promises that we now shift in ourselves today to make tomorrow better. So when we say to ourselves, I have something that's really been pressing, I need to do it. Remember that self-forgiveness is so essential for this to work. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be okay with failure. Because as you fail, you progress. You say, oh, I missed keeping that promise today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. And whether it's setting an alarm, whether it's telling somebody else you're going to do it, having an accountability partner, uh, whatever that case may be to be able to keep that promise tomorrow. When we live by the promises we made yesterday and we keep them today, everything changes for our lives. It's a beautiful thing. Jason, you uh, wrote a, uh, a post on Facebook in 2015 that you thought maybe 50, 100 people might read and then it ended up being 100 million. <laughs> Would you care to share what happened with that? Yeah, that's a funny one, actually. I was, I was at Target grabbing a few manly things, which you normally would, you know, just I was on my way out of town, so I grabbed some things that I do when I travel. I needed some sardines, beef jerky, beard trimmer, you know, beard wax, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, I running through the store to try to get to the checkout line. The quickest checkout line only had two people in it. So I jump in that line, I look up, and there's the most beautiful blonde I've ever seen. And in the moment, I realized that was my wife. I mean, it was a, a bizarre thing to think that my there's my wife, and I'm, I, I didn't even realize she was at the store. You see, we came in two different cars. I was on my way to the airport anyway, and so I didn't re realize she would be there. And there was a person between us, and so... I tried to get her attention. You know, I tried to think like, should I jump up on the, on the belt and be like, hey, honey, you know, and do the raptor or, you know, I tried to just get her attention a little bit, but she didn't look up. She was rifling through her purse for coupons and she was dealing with the person in front of us. And uh, what I find interesting about this experience is that she never noticed that I was there. And I just got to sit there and look at her and think of, the blessing that I have that is her and to be able to fall in love again, knowing that if I saw her pick her out of a crowd, you know, out of a million women, that's the one, that's the one that I am in love with, like in my soul. And that I just looked up real quick and there she was. And I fell deeply in love with that person and realized it was my wife. That's such a fascinating experience. And so I shared about this on, Facebook as I was writing it in bed that night and I just shared it in a way and said I'm embarrassed to admit this but I think I cheated on my wife today let me explain and so it was about cheating on my wife with my wife by falling in love with what I thought maybe was another woman but it was my actual wife it was such an odd story but it felt like a love story for the whole world of a man falling in love again with his wife when in reality I was never out of love it's just nice to be reminded that she is the one for me and everybody I think has somebody like that that they know is that person for them and I'm just fortunate to get to be with her and so I shared that online and it went crazy around the world I I woke up the next day to you know quite a bit of comments and within 48 hours it it was on the Today Show the top story in every country in the world um, even the same day that Kim Kardashian had a baby my name, Jason Hewlett, was trending higher than any name in the world for 48 hours <laughs> as the guy who cheated on his wife with his wife and helped the world fall in love again. It was cool. It's, uh, I just learned this researching you in the last couple of days. You've been full of surprises. Uh, never had anything go quite that viral and um, 
for some of the stuff I've put out, I'm probably glad now that I'm tempering <laughs> tempering back my my non rage fueled uh, <laughs> tweets. Now that I've de- deleted my Twitter account, um, social media really at at low points in my life brought out a, a they call it the shadow. They brought out a side of me that I um, didn't know that existed. And it's kind of ruined me running for president because if they go through the archives, they go, oh, wait, he said this. <laughs> and I'll be like, yep, I'll take full That's ownership it. of that. <laughs> Jason, the your last book came out in 2020. Have you got anything else in the pipeline? Another book, another idea, another process, another thought? Well, you know, that's a great question because we launched that book in 2020 with the intention of selling it at all of my corporate speeches. And what happened in 2020 is I lost all of those because the whole world shut down. So in essence, the book launched at number one on Amazon under the self-help dash spiritual category, which I did not know that was where it would land. But uh, apparently it's a spiritual book. And it's a self-help too. And I thought that it was a corporate read for a lot of you know businesses to buy my book when I spoke. Laban, I lost over a million dollars the in 2020 when all those events were canceled. That was hard of all my bookings that were lined up. And so I quickly switched into virtual mode, which here I am in my house on the same camera. I did a bunch of virtual gigs and that kind of kept things rolling. But The book never got its legs like I was hoping it would. Although it does have hundreds of reviews and pretty much all are five stars, it's it's an interesting thing. I've I've come to reconcile with the fact that the book did not sell as much as I had hoped it would with all the companies that that were supposed to buy it. And so I'm excited for the next book. Although this one I feel is it's in its own way a, a modern classic, which others have told me that's what it is to them the people that have really resonated with the message of a promise. And I like to say, why set a goal and you can make a promise. And so the promise theme will be what I'll be writing about in the future to answer your question. So I'm working on a book called Your Leadership Promise, which will be more of a corporate feel for putting teams together, finding the strengths of the people we work with, the signature moves and the superhero powers that they all have. And then, of course, I'll be writing the promise to the family, the promise of the dad, the, these types of other things. It will be a theme that I will be doing for years to come. And I, I look forward to getting those books out because they're, they're right here, man. They're just sitting there waiting. And you probably don't know this. I don't know if I mentioned this to you because I don't share this everywhere. I thought about that book for 20 years. I really did. I thought, okay, I'm going to write this. And I wrote a version of it and then I called it Signature Moves, and that came out in 20, 2007. Then I, I thought about it again, and I created something else. Anyway, Laban, one day I was realizing after I'd written the intro, probably 50 times after meddling around with it, <laughs> as you do with a book, I told my wife and kids, I said, I'm going to go in the motorhome. I'm going to drive to the mountaintop, and I'm going to stay there until the book is written. And I packed some sardines and some beef jerky and some <laughs> some crackers. And within three days, the book came to me. It took me three days to write 50,000 words. Wow. And uh, it was a divine download. I know it. And I came down from the mountain with sardines in my beard and beef jerky in my hair. And uh, like Moses from the mountain with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And I said, it is finished. <laughs> And instead of throwing my laptop down, I was glad it was in the cloud. And we got it published. And a, a pl- publisher of the people that actually published Napoleon Hill's uh, great books of uh, you know, Think and Grow Rich and Outwitting the Devil, the same publishers. Pretty cool. Wow. So I, uh, it, it, that's a small group that gets to be published by them. So that was the book, The Promise to the One. It's a, it's a life-changing read for the people that actually – take a minute to consider what it's talking about and think about how the promise can change them. Well, I can absolutely vouch for that. It is an incredible book and I've been listening to it on Audible as well. And because of time constraints, I had it on like 1.3. So like 
it was just a little bit faster than my normal leisurely pace, but it, it still came across beautifully. And, and I heard a great quote from uh, a friend of mine the other day. I don't know whether it was his, his quote or someone, someone else's, but he said that the best way to sell your first book is to write about it in your second one. And you can, <laughs> you know, you can do that it's with your, so pack, true. right? Yeah. And what about your Amazon special being called The Promise and doing an hour long special using the principles of The Promise and incorporating your incredible humor, clean humor in there? Dude, I think this is a winning, winning combination. Winning combination. Oh, yeah, eventually we'll get to that point. That would be a, a big bucket list for me would be to have The Promise be um, its own, you know, special like that, like you're saying, that would be really cool. And I love that you're listening to it at a faster speed. That's got to be hilarious. I'm like, <laughs> the end. <laughs> you're listening to Audible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. It'll be one of those ones I'll have to go back and reread. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to physically read it, but, um, I, I really, we spoke about this off camera as well. Like if you're an author and you've written a book and you're going to do an audible, do it in your own voice, unless you are Helen Keller and you can't. Got to do it in your own voice, man. And that's what I loved about your book is that your energy, your voice. I could just feel like I was sitting next to you on the bus and we're laughing after we escaped Disney, you know, like. It was just so fun to be a part of that with you. Well, here's something that I didn't even realize. And thank you again. This is very good for my confidence. The book, the audio book was recorded in a, stu a home studio in Charlottenburg in Berlin with Eric Wittenberg. Now, folks, what you won't know about Jason is that one of, I would say, your most famous acts is you doing Elton John singing and impressions uh, I don't know. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Oh yeah. Elton John, that was my guy, man. Right. So Eric is a vocal, uh, he's a, a vocal talent, a vocal voice artist, one of the best in Europe. And he's the one that did Elton John's audio book in German. Oh my gosh. There you go. There, there you go. There's the, the crazy quantum synergies. <laughs> I don't know what it sounds that'd, like in that'd German. That'd be fun to hear him sing it too, you know? That'd be cool. He's like, I can speak in lock and hockey, la, 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 la. Yeah, that'd, that'd be cool. No, but <laughs> but, my, but the my, Benny my, and the Jets. Yeah. <laughs> Benny! <laughs> Benny! <laughs> Benny! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, those are, those are good times being Elton John. So I was, a, for your listeners, viewers, I was an Elton John impersonator for Legends in Concert in Las Vegas at the uh, Imperial Palace. And, and I got to sing, you know, I remember when Iraq was young, me and Susie had so much fun. And then the whole, la, 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 la. That was a, that was a fun time. A lot of big costumes and a lot of earrings that, that I had to clip on. It was a good time. <laughs> uh a lot of people won't realize that you're a, a brilliant musician and I know that you certainly play the piano beautifully. Is there any other instruments that you can play? Piano is certainly the one I lean into the most, but I play harmonica. I figured out the harmonica so I could play Billy Joel's piano man while playing the piano. So that's a fun number. I've closed my shows for years with that. And I learned how to play the guitar just enough to be able to do a good Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Cat Stevens, a couple impressions that I needed to pull out once in a while. So can you, can you, you know, critique? Just, just a couple of chords. Couple can you chords. critique my Bob Dylan? Yeah, let's hear it. All right, <clears throat> haven't done it for a long time. I said it once upon a time you dressed so fine, didn't you? You never had to ask. <laughs> Dude, that's really good, actually. <laughs> like, that's better than mine. Mine is more like. <laughs> Hey, didn't you? I used to find in the bums of trying hip it hip it I what am I saying? Didn't you? Yeah, so yours is even better. <laughs> Nobody cares what these words are saying. Nobody cares at all. Hey. 
There's, uh, I reckon if, if we combine our vocal talents with Bob Dylan together, we might get something that uh, sounds just like him. Just I love like, it. Well just done. Like I, knew, I know you're my blood brother, man. It's so cool. <laughs> and it's funny, my younger brother, Josh, so I've got three siblings who are all incredible uh, artists, um, singers and musicians. And I, I don't sing or play an instrument, but I can do impressions. But my younger brother can do um, a, lot of this, a lot of similar impressions to that you can do not not to the same level obviously but um there's some talent in the family so i was always like the funny one but uh i reckon if i got singing lessons or you know maybe put a bit more effort into it i could develop an actual singing voice i don't know what are you what are your thoughts on that oh yeah man i mean really uh, a lot of singers are just able to have the right people surrounding them i mean there's a lot of bands that they put together the right musicians. They they get some harmonies in there. You can make anybody sound good nowadays with the vocal, you know, adjustments and things that they do with microphones. It's it's a thing that you ought to consider if you want. I can tell you that I'm not the best impressionist there is, and I've made a living at it for years. I'm I'm really not the best musician. And what's nice about it is that I realized early on that the best musicians and the best impressionists were pretty much studio guys or people that just kind of made a, a side hustle out of it. But if I was willing to put myself out there into a show that was over the top and was courageous and was ridiculous, I could overcome all of the facts that I was not nearly as good of a musician as others, not nearly as good an impressionist, but it, putting it all together made it feel like I had all of these things. And the audience dug that because they they liked me because I was just like their dorky neighbor. And that's what worked. And I've made a career off of being the dorky neighbor. It's worked. <laughs> well, you've uh, I remember reading about how your music teacher discovered your singing voice. And, and in addition to that, you had this incredible, very unique vocal range. Is that correct? Yeah, I do have a natural gift, which is a, you know, four plus octave range. And that's a very unique thing. Uh, doesn't mean that I'm uh, a great singer. It just means that I know how to use my voice. Do you, do you know how that came about? Are you aware of that or no idea? In terms of my, my voice itself. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just born that way, you know, just like, your superpower of being able to make everyone feel like they're the greatest person in the world. I mean, everybody has their thing, right? And so I have this vocal gift and I have obviously DNA that goes back to family that was in, um, in plays and musicals and big choirs and other things. So I've been blessed with a goodly parents, but also with goodly uh, DNA that allows me to have that very unique vocal range and, Obviously, I utilized it for not the reasons that my music teacher originally set out. She wanted me to be a, an opera singer or a king singer or one of those great, you know, vocalists. Instead, I turned into a guy who's like, ha, ha, hey, look what I can do. La, 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 la. <laughs> She's like, don't do that. And I'm like, la, la, la. <laughs> so that's what I used it for. <laughs> Oh, man, this is so inspiring. I really, when I'm around you, Jason, I, uh, I feel like maybe I should spend more time uh, pursuing some of these, these, these goals. The question I have, thinking on my feet, is would I have done it by now if I was really passionate enough about it, or is there something missing? Yeah, I guess we never know, right? And I mean, there are plenty of people that go after writing a book and they're, you know, writing multiple books. They'll never get to be a bestseller. There will be multiple people that will be great uh, speakers, but never the best, never a Hall of Famer. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of reasons as to why we never hit the top. And in a lot of the senses, I think that we're supposed to influence the people that we are along the way. If we hide that gift, then we're breaking a promise that we made to the world when we came here that we probably didn't realize we did, but we're supposed to find it and share it. Even if we're not the number one at it, if we are not sharing it, we're breaking a promise to the world 
that only we can keep. And so that's why I encourage everyone to, you know, go for that dream, that passion. Do it anyway. Even if you're not going to be number one or Hall of Famer or make a million dollars, do it anyway because it will resonate with somebody. And at some point you need to be able to reconcile with yourself that when you do close the book of your life, you can look back and say, at least I went for it. I'm glad I didn't hold it back because if I did, I'd be regretting now whatever state we're going to be in next. Amen, brother. Amen. Jason, I'm curious to know what's something, not necessarily recent, but what's something that someone said to you off the back of a performance or a show or them reading your book or being exposed to your content somehow that's just truly humbled you? I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, uh, I mean, some of the most profound would be when they come up and they say, I've never faced the fact that I spent all my time working or doing my hobbies or other things instead of being the present dad that I should have been. And that's probably the most fulfilling part of my whole deal that I do in, in life is to see a man own up to being a better father. Because a lot of the times, you know, uh, intrinsically women are more nurturing and it's easier for them to be a good mom. But a lot of dads fall by the wayside and I think give up. And so to be able to have a, have men come up to me and say, I've been a delinquent dad, but I'm going to be a great grandpa. You know, that kind of a thing. Or I'm not dead yet. I'm going to go reconcile with my son or my daughter. That's a great promise that I just... I can't get over the fact that that's what people can get out of a corporate message at a leadership conference, that they're walking away with something that says, I am now empowered to know I need to keep a promise to myself by reaching out to the people that I've left behind or I haven't been as present with. And I'm going to delete the app off my phone and get rid of that, which is taking over my, my intention and my life and so forth. And uh, I really, I'm inspired by that. The people that talk to me after the speech inspire me so much. Yeah, that's awesome, Jason. I, uh, is, is what you're describing right there purpose? Oh, yeah. Because some of the people that I work with from a coaching point of view or people that have conversations with that have been lied to or ignored the warning signs about what they were told was going to be success in life, the house, the car, the, the beautiful wife, you know, the kids, the what, you know, whatever. For me, it's purpose. It's fulfillment. And, you know, I joked about doing IT recruitment for 14 years with, with the benefit of hindsight. I despised it, you know, that wasn't very rewarding from a fulfillment point of view. And, and, but as soon as I fell into doing what I'm doing now, not that you could ever fall into this, but jumping into it, uh, I, I start to experience more and more of that. And it builds this momentum, which encourages me to keep going when times are tough. Do you have any advice for other new entrepreneurs that are experiencing a number of setbacks and maybe not feeling appreciated or their blogs not being read, that type of thing? Great question, man. The blog not being read. Let's talk about that for a minute. I've been writing the Promise blog for over a decade. It goes out every Sunday morning to my readers at 5 a.m. I have never missed writing it in 10 years. I probably get two comments on average. And I get four because I reply to them. <laughs> and so why do I bring that up? Because for me, part of the joy of what I get to do as a speaker is that I get to write about it and I get to th see other people doing or breaking promises and I can share those stories. And so I have an unlimited amount of things I can write about. But when it comes to being needing the validation of an audience clapping for me, I don't need that anymore. I've had plenty of that and I'm grateful for it. But I can say now sitting here at this desk and talking to you 
this to me is as fulfilling as doing a standing ovation gig in front of a thousand people. Because we're talking about things that can change people's lives. And so when it comes to that passion, that purpose, I would say that making it so that the audience will appreciate it and love it and share it and that you know that, that's a really fulfilling thing for sure. To be a speaker on a stage, to be an author that's the bestseller, to make a million dollars doing that invention you created. Awesome. The question really comes down to, what is your promised legacy project? That's what I would ask. It's something that you would create whether anyone gave you a standing ovation or not. It's something that will live beyond you. It's something that if the plane were going down, you would say to yourself, oh, I'm so grateful I got that one thing done. What is it? That's a promised legacy project. Something you don't care if anyone ever sees, but you at least got it out of you. And if we can get to that point with the business we create and whether people buy it or not, you can at least lay down at night and say, I created that thing which has been festering inside of me. I knew I had to get it out and I gave it my all. That is success. Beyond the millions, beyond the, the financial greatness or the you know, publicity of all of the things you do. Laban, when I am in line at the grocery store and a person comes up to me and says, Hey, are you Jason Hewlett? And I say, yeah, how do I know you? And they go, I read your blog every week. And I say, what's your name? And they tell me, and I've never heard of them before. And I say, oh, I didn't know you were a reader. And I go, you've never commented. And they said, no, I just don't comment. And I, I guess I probably should. But I did share your blog with my Sunday school class today. And I know it helped those kids. That, to me, is success. That's awesome, dude. <clears throat> That's awesome. <sighs> While we've got you here, how do they find the blog? Just at jasonhewlett.com, or you can just be my friend on LinkedIn. Just come join me on LinkedIn, and that's where I like to play a lot. I do have all the social media everywhere, but I... I prefer LinkedIn and then, uh, yeah, jasonhewlett.com if they can spell my name right. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's one other Jason Hewlett on YouTube. I don't know what he does, but he's <laughs> doesn't hold a candle <laughs> in the wind. <laughs> in the, I knew you were going to say it. I knew it. <laughs> Look at this. Is it that predictable? Is it that predictable? Or is it quantum mechanics? Let's just blame quantum mechanics. That's cool, quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, that you weren't going to say it, I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I had a, I had a, a two part question for you. Have you at any point in the last say ten years? So you've you're already trucking along and going gangbusters in the last ten years. Have you ever had any moments of despair and have forgotten about your ability to contribute? And then, if you have, how did you get over that? Despair is a strong word. I would say the closest I've come to that was during the pandemic uh, while we were trapped in the house. with the, We have four kids and trying to figure out, are we doing our best here, you know? But I'll tell you, despair came when losing millions of dollars in bookings, that, that's tough. But also trying to figure out how do you keep the level of living your children are used to and expect. And hopeful that they don't see you as a failure in the midst of the greatest closure of life that we've ever seen in the history of our planet. <laughs> that was a, that was a very reconciliation type moment for me to say, is it only because of what I provide that they'll be happy? Is it only my expectation of what they see in me that matters, or can I reset the expectation and say, we're just blessed to have anything and to have a house and food to eat? As we canceled our Netflix subscriptions and as we stopped eating out and as we slowly pulled up the bootstraps to survive, as my children saw that their dad was not going to go out and get a real job and 
Instead, I said to them, you guys, we're all in this together. I said, I don't want to scare you, but I do want you to understand. We've just lost all of our money for the future. Luckily, we've had some saved because we never knew this could come. But I said, I need your help. I need you to hold the camera. And I need you to hold the lights. And I need you to hit the microphone. And I need you to make sure the dog doesn't bark. And we're going to go virtual. And we're going to go live. Now you're all part of the team. This was my moment of despair. But it, it was a time where I knew that I had to keep the promise to my family and include everyone in the midst of the challenge. And we all stepped up together, and they, they helped me through it. They were my teachers, my children and my wife, as well as the people online that I saw that were still fighting. I saw lots of people giving up. But it was the people that were still fighting that I said, okay, if they can do it, then I'm going to keep going too. Here we go. Amen, brother. Amen. Have you come across or met, spent any time with uh, Canadian speaker Sean Kanungo? I don't know the name. Need to look Sean, Sean uh, S H A W N K A N U N G O, I think. He's Indian uh, background, but born in Edmonton in Canada. He was voted by Forbes magazine in 2020 as the number one virtual speaker on the planet. Prior to 2020, he hadn't done any virtual keynotes. He was a wow. he was a professional speaker, and then same as same deal as you. And I was at the Professional Speakers Association conference in Adelaide, their their national conference, the weekend that the pandemic hit, and and people were crying out in the hallway, like same deal, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of bookings cancelled, and Sean hired out these theatres that were empty for next to nothing and had a, a skeleton crew and uh, was knocking off all these keynotes left, right and centre, became incredibly successful, wrote a book called The Bold Ones, released a, a Netflix special or a Apple TV special called The Bold Ones. And I, with whatever you think of these two people, he's speaking on stage with them next week. He's with um, Bill and Hillary Clinton. And, uh, you know, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Actually, you did, Slick Willie, and this is going to be a chapter in my next book. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and a lot of people did give up. A lot of people really did give up, and you didn't, and come out the other side of this and just absolutely crushing it, at least from what I can tell. So congratulations to you, sir. Well, I love that story about Sean, and I can't wait to look him up. I, I know there were similar stories like that all around, and that's what kept me going was to see some of my friends that were like, let's figure this out. Let's make it work. And it was it was really fascinating, and I think that we've learned a lot, and I'm so grateful to have gone through it. It's nice to now see what life is like and remember what life was. I mean – had we never known, you know, we wouldn't be as grateful perhaps to today about what we have. I know you had a quite a harrowing situation yourself during that time, you know, and obviously you can now look at your beautiful bride and you can look at your book and your life and the way things are going compared to where they were even at that time, man. It's amazing, your story. I mean, you're as inspiring now to me as you would have been in the midst of it. <laughs> Well, uh, one part that didn't make the book was uh, we were living in Melbourne, Australia during before the lockdowns. I was there for 18 years or so. And we had a heap of bushfires in January of 2020, like a, a huge amount. Smog everywhere and people were screaming out for N95 masks. And I had a truckload of them because I, I wasn't working and I developed this relationship with a supplier and had them. And so when COVID hit for about two weeks, I was making three or $4,000 a week selling masks. And I was like, this is brilliant. And then, and then they shut down selling them on eBay and Facebook marketplace, unless you were a, a registered seller. And of course I couldn't, I, I lost any ability to earn any income. And, and then the price went through the roof and I was left with all the stock. And so uh, I have to give, 
a shout out to to my friend um, who runs the the company um, who took back the stock. You know, like ten thousand dollars worth. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what an incredible experience, Jason. I uh, we'll wrap this up in a minute, but I wanted to ask you something selfishly for me, but I hope the audience will benefit from it. What I'm, I'm going to give you full veto rights here to critique me. And I would love if you're happy to, to provide any feedback in terms of improvements or things that I can do that are obvious to you to make me a better communicator, speaker, uh, the whole, the whole gamut, putting you on the spot here. Oh, geez, man. I mean, I, I can't see one thing I would improve. I, I know that you and I have talked about the, uh, the strong language, and that's the only thing that would, would hold you back in terms of, you know, in, in, uh, in a book and becoming mainstream and those types of things. That would be it. You know, obviously you haven't done any of that here today, which is, which is awesome. And, you know, at the same time, I, I, don't, I don't use the strong language myself, and I feel that that allows me to have a broader reach. And so I think that if there were other words that could be chosen, although a well-placed strong word is appreciated by any great person of comedy, <laughs> I can say that I've had to figure out ways creatively to make it so that I don't use that language. That, that would be the only absolute critique that I can even think. And that's like me really reaching on your behalf to try to be helpful. But I, I don't think that it's affected you any way outside of, you know, just, Maybe somebody who would hear it and say, oh, I can't have my kids listen to that book. That might be my only sad part about your book is that I wouldn't be able to say to my, you know, 15 year old son, you've got to listen to this book. The problem is, is if dad gives him books that have, you know, too many strong words or suggestions in there, then I, I have a challenge. Right. And so that would be my only thing is if there were a way that it would be true to yourself without, you know. Uh, handcuffing yourself to the rules of the world or whatever. But if you could say, yeah, I could do a family friendly version of that book. My, my man, I know a lot of people would love that. That is really, really great feedback. And, you know, you're certainly not the first person to say that. And it's funny when I listen back to interviews or if I've been a guest or even when I'm interviewing people and I do use profanity, I don't like it. And I don't like it. Even with and that's audiobook. okay. That's that's a part of part of who you are, what you how you say things. And hey, man, it's funny. It lands. And I get also why you are like, I don't like how that sounds. I mean, I, I get it, you know, so and I do the same thing with the way that I say, you know, too many times or like too many times or um too many times. So it's just a it's a habit. That's it. Great feedback. Thanks very much. And, and folks, you can implement this in your own life as well. You don't need to be a speaker or have a podcast or any of this stuff to take uh, one of many nuggets that, that Jason's blessed us with today. You mentioned it just before, Jason, but is, is there anything that you want to promote or anything you want to talk about in terms of uh, upcoming stuff in addition to jasonhewlett.com? Well, thank you. I, I mean, I, I would love for anybody to go check out on Audible or on Amazon, The Promise to the One. My performance of it is fun, and uh, listening at one and a half speed is <laughs> might be more interesting. <laughs> but I have created recently something that's very cool, and if anybody out there is interested in communicating better or just in ways to live life a little bit better, I've just started creating a YouTube channel. It's brand new. I, I only have around 300 subscribers right now, but I've been launching a video every other day for the last few months. And uh, this is an expensive endeavor because I sit in front of a camera for eight hours and I record 20 episodes at a time and they have to be 10 minutes minimum. And I'm just delivering to the camera. I'm not reading from a prompter or anything. But this will be helpful to anyone that wants to be a better speaker, communicator, a parent, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of hard to find, but it's, it's under Jason hewlett J H E. And so if you go there, I have, a, I have a smattering of great videos. I think we have 30, 40 videos by now. And we'll be doing one for as long as I can keep this going. And I've, I've been told by some speakers, Hall of Fame speakers and coaches, that it's the most 
powerful channel they've ever subscribed to because I'm sharing all of the fails that I've had and all of the best ways that I know to succeed in the business as a speaker and performer and communicator. Amazing. Uh, we'll make sure that's in the show notes. And I, and I don't want you to brag necessarily, Jason, but I want people to see just how credible you are. What are you charging for an average keynote, um, including travel these days in US dollars? Yeah. So, I, I mean, at, today I'm charging 25000 for the hour and then uh, plus travel, which is 1500 And if I go overseas, it's 50000 instead. And that's just because it's such a hassle to go that far away and turn away other date opportunities. But yeah, last year I was able to get a, an event for 50,000 in Macau. That was exciting. I, I flew in, did the gig, 30 minute gig, 50 grand, flew home. It, it hurt my back doing that trip cause I did it in 60 hours. So I was really tired cause 30 there and 30 back on the plane, but for 50 K you'll do a lot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, folks, 50 grand for 30 minutes. I mean, plus, plus or minus the 59 and a half hours of travel. But um, this guy's a serious player. So, uh, and I've seen some of the amazing videos you got in there, Jason, and I feel like I've just been blowing smoke the whole entire time, but I will not apologize because I mean every word of it. Jason, do you have any concluding thoughts for our amazing audience today? Well, first of all, you have an amazing host. As you know, listening to this and watching it, Laban is one of my favorite new people that I've just met. And I'll tell you what's fun about him is that he's got incredible talents to make people feel good about themselves. He's got this presence that is very unique. I mean, he walks into a room and everybody turns and looks and says, who is that? Because he's got energy. He's not, he's not flamboyant, he, but he's got charisma. He's got a special place in his heart for everybody that he meets. And what I want you to understand as a listener and a viewer of a show like this is that when you take the time for yourself to listen to something like this and take it in, think about the ways that you can make something just a little bit better in this world, how you can be just a little bit more of the superhero you're meant to be. Oftentimes, it's just being willing to step into that phone booth, take off the glasses and pull out the cape. Unfortunately, so many times people are scared to do that. And so if today is your chance to say, I'm going to keep a promise to share my gifts that only I have, I hope that today is the launching pad for what you're going to create for the rest of your life and gift to the rest of the world by keeping your leadership promise. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Hewlett.